finally, we're moving to our topic of today, invest. And we actually checked how other cities are dis discussing about it. Many are talking about financials, many are talking about uh, investing yourself and like self-development. But also, when, when we actually saw this picture, I started to think about city very much. This is so much about like investing in the city development and uh, we were thinking home to call and we decided to call an architect and professional and I would say urbanistics and city development and to talk actually about uh, like how culture or cult cultural events and any kind of human creative activity can uh, help cities to develop. So I think it will be very interesting. Feel free to ask questions in the end. I think we will have about 10, 15 minutes, depends how, how it goes. And yes, uh, the illustration was done by illustrator Bao Ho, and uh, I forgot what the chapter, because usually each city chooses the theme, so you can check out in social media, I forgot who, which city proposed this theme. What, Hong Kong, oh yeah. So actual, Hong Kong proposed this theme. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ani. And uh, yes, I don't know when will, will be our turn to propose the theme, maybe in five or ten years, but we'll see. Uh, so yeah, welcome, Ivan, on stage. Now it's your time. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I guess I need to switch slides. Uh -huh. Okay, there we go, I believe. Or what's going on here? Yes, all right, I think we're good. Okay, cool. Um, hi, good morning. Um, my name is Ivan Sergeyev. Uh, I am an architect uh, by education and, well, by training and professional experience. Let me just show you real quick who I am. Uh, currently, I serve as the advisor for sustainable development, sustainable architecture in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications here in Estonia. Um, immediately before this, I was the chief city architect of the city of Narva. Um, so today, we're going to focus mostly on, on, on Narva, as far as I understood. And we're going to try and see how this whole invest um, and city development and community development uh, all go hand in hand. So um, I don't know, how, how many of you have been to Narva? <laughs> okay, well, we can just skip this whole part. Uh, but basically, um, let me just give you a quick rundown then. Um, Narva is the easternmost uh, point of Estonia. Um, it's, you know, uh, as we joke uh, there is that the city itself is like, meh, you know, so-so, but the suburbs are great. We have St. Petersburg on one side and Tallinn on the other. Um, the city itself is pretty small. It's only two kilometers uh, radius, uh, which... It's really funny because it, it really is like a half circle in two kilometers. I was wondering, I was drawing uh, diagrams for this one competition that we're currently organizing there. And I was thinking, I wonder if that, that almost looks like, you know, like if an atomic bomb is, falls here, then this is the fallout area <laughs> or whatever. Like, uh, I don't know what the logic was, but this is not how the city used to look like. Uh, this is what it looks like now. But what, this is what we know about Narva, you know, the previous Narva, the Narva before the Second World War. It was the Pearl of the Baroque of Northern Baroque. Basically what happened is in 1659, I believe, the whole city burned down. You know, it was fashionable to burn down cities at that time. Uh, you know, London burned down. Uh, Narva also burned down for the same reason. Somebody, you know, just kind of, I don't know, something went wrong. The city was made out of wood, so everything's just, a pow, you know. So after that, they decided not to repeat the mistake and build of stone. And since they built it all in very fast, um, then the style was very consistent Baroque. Uh, it was really well known and rivaled Tallinn in its beauty, as they say. But then 1944 happened, March uh, 1944, when the city got bombed to shreds. Again, nothing new, but what was new is that the city was not rebuilt. Um, so instead of the old, uh, good old, you know, um, two, three story old town little city, which uh, was populated by about 30,000 people altogether, we started getting like a new proud socialistic city that was built on industry. Um, so yeah, you know, the, um, the Baltic power station, the Estonian power station, the Baltiets, uh, uh, uranium enrichment, top secret facility, basically like the city just kind of 
it grew as if on steroids, and it reached about 85 uh, or 80, 84,000 people uh, by the time the Soviet Union collapsed. So it was a much bigger city. Uh, what is funny is that neither the city environment nor the population were the same. So the city got bombed to shreds and then rebuilt as I showed you, but the people were also uh, essentially, uh, they were, they were um, shipped out of the city before the bombing and then not really allowed to come back in. So the people who came back into Narva or he came to Narva after the war were mostly Russian speaking uh, people from you know, the region surrounding or like near Narva and St. Petersburg. Uh, that explains why we have the ethnic composition that we do have. But so basically the city in the, you know, in the time after the Second World War, the city um, got used to perceiving itself as the avant-garde of the working class. You know, the people were building the socialist um, world. Uh, but then, you know, a new era happened. So uh, Estonia regained independence. Not everybody was up for it. Um, if you can read in Russian, then those are pretty telling. Um, like, you know, don't let them destroy the union uh, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so suddenly a border appeared. So Narva, before, before Estonia regained independence, it was not a border city. Like it forgot to be th that it was a border city. It was the border city through the centuries before between you know the different orders between Russia and Sweden, between all sorts of entities. But during the second, during the Russian Empire's rule and then during the Soviet rule, Narva was not. So in a sense, the, the appearance of the reappearance of the border was a huge surprise to people, especially if we consider that most of the industry that the city was built on was actually built to cater towards the east rather than towards the west, because well you know the West and Soviet Union kind of stopped in 200 kilometers. So, it, it would, so most of the production went to the East. So when the border appeared, obviously most of the industries collapsed and by the time Vanya went to first grade, people were like starving on the street. Uh, we actually declared, or we, I mean, I didn't, but, but uh, some local politicians decided, had the audacity to, to try and declare a referendum to see if we can, if Narva can become like an autonomous territory. Um, it failed, thankfully, so we stayed in Estonia. Uh, but you know that's the th that didn't help build ties between Narva's community, uh, especially the political community and the central government. Um, so unemployment uh, started, you know, not not much development. Russian speaking, not welcome in this country. All of that good stuff. So that's the environment that I was brought up in, or that I kind of you know I was pretty lucky with my parents uh, bringing me up the way they did, uh, sending me to Estonian. Um, you know, clubs and things so that I could so I could study language and get integrated into the new country that I was part of. Uh, but not everybody did that. Um, so in 2006, I left uh, Narva uh, thinking that, you know, like, adios, never coming back. Um, and went to study first to Tallinn, then I went to the States. Um, but then I came back to Estonia. And uh, in 2016, I came back to Estonia as the chief city architect. So it was a completely new position. For me, uh, I've worked as an architect pretty much all over, uh, but the chief city architect is something else. Um, the chief city architect, and this is interesting, where like basically architecture is somebody investing money into the built environment, right? So architecture doesn't just emerge. Somebody has to put resources, finances, their labor into the built environment. And an architect is the person who kind of gives it sh shape and form and structures it. So in a sense, my job is really directly linked to investments, like actual financial investments. Uh, that's you know, what I have to keep in mind always. But as, a, but as an architect, usually you are um, catering to an investor. So somebody comes to you and says, you know, I want an office building. And you're like, all right, let's see what we can do for you. Uh, as a city architect, you're supposed to be curating the investment landscape in the city. So kind of see where you should, you know, up the levels a little bit. You see where we're really doing okay on certain things, but certain things need more work. And so in a sense, coming back to Narva as in my new quality in 2016, what I saw was you know, a lot of the same thing. So Narva, the way I left it, sort of. Uh, the old industry, this is Kranholm, a manufacturing facility that used to house or used to give work to about 12,000 people at some point that closed. It looked like this when I came back. Um, you know, the demographics, as I told you, we lost a lot of 
uh, let's say blood, we lost a lot of people. We used to be about 82, 80, it, it depends on what statistic you look at. Um, you know, there's a lie, there's a blatant lie, and then there's statistic. Uh, but anyway, so we lost about a third of the population um, during the, you know, uh, during the time since Estonia regained independence. And so the demographic pyramid doesn't really look like a pyramid at all. Um, the ethnicity and citizenship situations are pretty fun. Uh, ethnicity on the left, citizenship on the right. As you can see, there are less than half of people who live in Narva actually have Estonian citizenship, um, which is, you know, interesting uh, grounds for making all sorts of assumptions, um, which typically don't hold true, uh, but, um, but it's a telling picture. And then the ethnicity. As I told you, most of the people after the war who came to build up the city uh, were Russian-speaking and still are. But at the same time, what I saw when I came back was um, that there really is a lot of investment, a lot of public investment. The country has actually been putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into, into developing the city. So for example, Narva College of Tartu University appeared um, on the left. On the right, we have the historic town hall. Um, so, um, you know, we have the new Narva River Promenade. Uh, we have the Yoro Beach Building. Um, you know, the Vabalava, Vabalava Theater that just opened, let's say, what, like a year and a half ago. Um, the little stories coming to Narva and so on and so forth. So, so we're really like pumping, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, there, are, there are a bunch of ongoing projects. Um, a lot of them are being built currently. And the general atmosphere was like fine, but there really seemed to be some sort of a problem. So, so as far as we look in architecture and investments as far as like money, especially from the public sector, then we're actually doing quite fine. What I saw is that we're lacking, like completely lacking um, private investment. Um, and so I started thinking like, what, 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 you know, what is it? Like, what is it that's holding, uh, that's holding the city back? And what I realized is that, yeah, really, the problems of Narva are not really the problems of, or they are too, but not only the problems of the built environment. It's the publicity, it's the, you know, the rap that we have also in Estonia and internationally. This is, these are the titles of some of the newspapers that were running right after the Crimea crisis happened in 2014. So we automatically be became, for a lot of people, we became like the new hotspot, you know, like, oh my God, Narva, majority speaking, Russian speaking population, uh, a lot of people unemployed, they're really unhappy with their life, and like, oh my God, what's gonna happen, you know? So, th so there is a lot of like this panic out of the blue. Uh, the people in Narva didn't get it. They were like, hey, we're, you know, just, yeah, I do want a job, but that's okay, I like it here, you know? But it didn't really work for the, the, the international press wanted a different story. Uh, but plus, I mean, if you look at Narva, I mean, you know, do you want to invest in this? So, <laughs> so not too inspiring to invest in, and not only investments as far as banks and, you know, the cool kids are concerned, but also investment from the local community. Like the people who live in this building, are, what are they thinking? They're mostly thinking about, oh, you know, I just need to make enough money for my kids to go to school and then leave this place and never come back. And so this house can stay the way it is. It doesn't matter. You know, like it's, it's not actually my home. It's like, it's just, I just stay here for a little while, uh, but I don't want to invest in actually making it my home because the, the place that I'm currently in, I'm not really happy with it. I'm not really planning to stay. Um, so that was the issue that I kind of realized and that's why I started thinking that, okay, it seems like Narva needs a different kind of investment. It needs, it needs a different kind of attitude, a different kind of approach. It doesn't really have to do that much with me, you know, providing, like as a city architect, providing some like grand scenarios for how we are going to build architecture here. Like it doesn't, it actually beside the point. Like architecture will need to follow. First we need to fix some other things. So what I started doing was um, smaller things. Um, so we brought sensibility. Uh, <laughs> Yep, during the same period, actually. Narva is also written there. Uh, Stensibility and, and Mextonia to Narva to make uh, one of the first, um, you know, pieces of public uh, street art. Uh, we obviously got a lot of um, stink for it uh, because, you know, what is a Mexican woman doing in a, on a house in, in Narva anyway? Um, but but, but it, was a, it was a first and it was important because right after that we started, we started having local artists just kind of popping up and like new street art popping up all over town. Um, and now it's actually going pretty well. So it, it, the city just needed to show that, hey guys, um, like you really can't draw on the walls. Like just make sure it's a good thing, you know? Don't just, you know, yeah, don't do that. Uh, draw something good. 
Um, <laughs> so, so, so we had to do that. That's, that cost like, what, 2,000 euros. That's not a big investment, but it's a huge investment if you think in how you start perceiving your built environment. Then um, helped organize the neighborhood communities seminar uh, the first time in Narva. Nobody knew what neighborhood communities are. Everybody knows what neighborhood communities are here in Tallinn, but somehow the news haven't reached Narva, which is somewhat the typical situation, unfortunately. But so we organized a, fest, a little seminar on that topic. I brought some people from Tartu, from, uh, from Tallinn, uh, showed the local folks of how the community can actually you know, live and function. Um, started a community park. This uh, area used to be um, well, a junkyard, essentially. Like, people would just throw their fridges out here. It's in the middle of the city. Uh, what we decided to do was to... But at the same time, people kept coming back, kept coming to me as a city architect saying, hey, I really want to plant trees, you know? Like, we should, like, make the city green and stuff. And I'm like, all right, great, there are so many of you. Let's just put you all together and make you do a park. Like, instead of you putting three trees here, th two trees there, you know, five trees there, we'll just, like, do an actual thing. And so what we, what we came up with was a community park which we dedicated to Estonia Centennial. And it's, it used to look like this, now it actually looks like a park. There is a park there. Uh, so that was a huge win. Um, uh, then, you know, the Estonian Academy of Arts uh, came to Narva to do their workshops and things. So there were, there were essentially what I started doing was, uh, I started reaching out to as many people as I could, um, doing all sorts of things. At some point, I became the tour guide, you know, because if anybody was coming to Narva, then they had to see Ivan Sergeyev because Ivan Sergeyev is going to show the coolest places around town. That, like, became a mission to just kind of, <laughs> just kind of show that, hey, you know, like, there is, uh, yeah, there's that. Uh, but, you know, in, in, like, if you go here and then, like, two floors down, it's going to be an awesome pub. You know, you know, like, like that kind of stuff. So, um, so what what that ended up what that ended up doing was um, I started meeting people, um, meeting a lot of people, and and that's how I pretty much. Uh, Narva is not a big city. It's it's easy to know all the people who do something um, in Narva. Um, so that's essentially how, in a couple of years, I did meet everyone who was doing something, and and that became like the the dream team of sorts of whom we did a lot of other things with. Um, not everybody is from Narva, as you can see, probably. Uh, we have Helen Siltna right here, the founder of Tallinn Music Week, uh, which is going to happen here in Tallinn in a month. Uh, but she's a big driver behind Narva's development in the last few years. Then you can see Valeria Lavrova right here, uh, who's the founder of the local opinion festival called Bazaar. Um, so she, she was in charge during the festivals that we started organizing later. Uh, she was in charge of the, uh, you know, the talks sessions and stuff. So the um, artist Eduard Zenchik who joined us, uh, Grigori, who is a legendary uh, figure in Narva for organizing all sorts of concerts and theater performances and whatnot. So you have this, you have, you know, when you reach out to people, you end up like meeting the people that you want to form a team with and that become the, the actual power machine. And then what's the one that's, you know, when you have that, you can start building shit. So um, what we started building was a festival. Um, essentially what happened was this, um, d do you remember I showed you this little sketch of Narva, of like Krenholm and like a festival or something going on? And essentially I was giving a tour to Helen when she came to Narva with a different, uh, with a different thing. And when we go to Krenholm, I'm like, you know, there could be like a festival here and it's like in my dream and it's like amazing. She's like, you know it is, yeah, let's do a festival here. And so we did a festival, um, and, and here is what it looked like. In 2018, we started, um, we did the first one, um, and we had, you know, Tricky, among other people, performing on the stage. And then in 2019, this year, well, last year, we had Gus Gus uh, coming from Iceland, we had Hatari, we had a, a bunch of amazing performers. Um, <laughs> in a sense, it was funny, because people didn't believe that we were actually doing a festival like that, of that scale in Narva. They were like, wait, you're bringing who to Narva? Uh, how are they coming in? You know, but, but, but when you have the right people and the right team, and I mean, people here in Lyft 99, I'm sure know that, and that's what you guys are hunting for, is when you have a great team, you know, it doesn't, you, you don't care. Like, everything's possible. Um, 
so yeah, Station Arbor became this one big project that I started doing aside from my work. So my main work as a city architect involved, you know, giving construction permits and stuff like that with my team. So I obviously kept doing that. But having discovered this need for a different kind of a development, I started getting into little things and the Station Arbor Festival became the biggest one to build up the community. So we have a business festival, we have the music program, we have an actual community program. So these are the guys from the so-called Narvas Venice that uh, you know helped us build a city stage this year. So it's a festival that um, reaches out into the community and really what it does, it, it changes people's behavior and it changes people's minds as to making them want to invest in the place where they live. See, that's the end, that's the end uh, purpose. Uh, but then the, pretty much the same team, we happen to, you know, kind of get ourselves into the process of preparing Narva's um, uh, European Capital Culture bid that you might have heard about, uh, that we're running for the last, you know, one and a half years, two years. Um, that was incredible because uh, it, to a huge, it was, Narva was a surprise candidate. Nobody expected Narva to run, and so when Narva did officially state that, hey, we're going to do it, everybody's like, you said, what? You know, like, amazing, like, you guys go. So we, had, we really had a feeling, the city had a feeling that for the first time in, like, 20 whatever years, uh, the whole country is rooting for it. You know, even people from Tartu, I don't know, people from Tartu, uh, were coming to Narva and saying, hey, guys, you know, like, we know we know that you need it more. Like, you know, I don't know. I've, pretty much most of the people that I've, I've, I've met, all the people that I met, uh, were rooting for Narva. And I was incredible because we've never had that kind of support before, ever. Um, and then, you know, we had the big cultural Big Bang. Uh, suddenly we had the different theater, performer, theater performances. We had uh, festivals. We had completely new initiatives, you know, urban festivals like the Narva Detroit that I think uh, Marina, you were also involved in, um, and the whole concept was that Narva cannot, it, it doesn't have to be a border town. What it could be is a collaboration hub between Europe and Russia. And that's the kind of the main topic that we're running on. Um, by the time we were, you know, uh, by, by the time the candidacy was pretty much up, or the, the decisions were due, 85% of the population was supporting the candidacy. So the local community was actually supporting the initiative, which is an amazing success, because usually people don't care. Here they were actually actively supporting. Um, you know, and all sorts of community events and little uh, things started popping up, like one of them is the uh, the, what ended up being the title of our bid book, uh, Narva is Next, uh, is actually a hashtag that is supposed to highlight everything that is good about Narva and how Narva wants to be next. Uh, what it, how it came to be was, you know, the, t the titles of the newspapers I showed you before, is Narva next? Is Narva going to be the next Crimea and all of that? We just kind of twisted it inside out and we were like, you know what, we are. But, <laughs> but, but not in the way that you guys want us to be. And so using that little bit of shock therapy, uh, it really helped us kind of rebrand Narva um, in, a, in a really good way. And people started noticing. So the, the press has changed. Um, you know, the tourism numbers actually kept, uh, are jumped, spiked, and they keep rising. So in, uh, since, we, since we announced the candidacy, like basically in the first half a year, we had like a 21% rise in, in tourism in Narva. So that brings me, well, yeah, um, that brings me to, to an important point. Um, investment in the community brings investment into actual real estate and built environment. So essentially that was my little kind of case study that I wanted to conduct on Narva and see if that is actually gonna work. Um, and, and it did. So um, I can't say that we have much more of private investment now, but we definitely have a different nouveau. We definitely have a different attitude, and we definitely have the numbers now uh, that will help us. So investment in, investing into the soft tissues can actually bring about investment into hard tissues as well, and that's an important thing to keep in mind always. Uh, well, yeah, uh, Tartu won. Obviously, I love this picture. It just shows all the emotions, um, including Narva's emotions there. Uh, that, that's one of our partners, the Kunst um, um, uh, Tallinn's Art Hall. But anyway, so uh, Narva will, I don't think Narva will ever going to be the same. Uh, and the point uh, that I would like to finish with is you know, whether it's a periphery or the cutting edge is really up to us to decide and make. Um, and what we need to do is to invest in what we what and who we love. Uh, and that kind of brings me to what I do now, because once, um, 
we had the festivals once we well lost the title. Um, kind of felt like my job in Narva is done. Like other people can control the built environment. Um, you, you really don't need me. That's not my unique qualities to, 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 to check if buildings comply with code. Like, you know, you, other people can do that. So what I decided to refocus on was the environment. And, and the perfect place for me to do that was the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications, where I now curate the sustainable construction uh, effort. Uh, of Estonia. Uh, so the scale is a little different, um, but basically I think if we don't get that figured out in the next few years, then we're screwed. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, all the cultural capitals and investments into Narva might be completely beside the point if we don't fix the environment. So so I think that is the most important thing for, for me to do right now. Um, that's what I love and that's what I want to do right now. But anyways, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and come visit my hometown. <laughs> I believe we have questions now, right? Um, what happened, indeed? Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Um, okay. So what? I, what, what? How I did? How I got the position was I applied and I got in. Uh, but um, it's simple, straightforward. But before that, before that, what I did was okay. 2006, I finished high school. Uh, 2010, I study and I work at the same time. Uh, I worked in a local office called Urban Mark Architects. Uh, Ular Mark, the head of that office, used to be the chief city architect of Narva before. So that's part of the reason why I started working for him while I was in college. So that lasted until 2010. I got a Fulbright scholarship. I went to the United States. I studied there for a couple of years um, at Virginia Tech. Uh, Virginia Tech is maybe rings a bell, uh, but in architecture, it's a pretty well-known school. Um, so studied there for a couple of years, got my master's degree there, uh, worked in New York for OMA for a year. Uh, maybe I should pull up the first slide. Uh, yep, this one. So yeah, worked for May in New York for a year. Um, then I came back to Estonia because the Fulbright Exchange uh, allows you to be in the United States, at least in case, in the way it worked here was that it allowed you to be in, a, in, a, in the United States for three years max, and then you had to, had to come back to your home country. So I did, worked for a local office here a little while, um, you know, participated in the Tallinn Ar Architecture Biennale, um, tried starting my own office and stuff, uh, but then the position of the chief city architect in Narva appeared on my radar, and um, and I already had an idea that okay, um, you know it is my hometown. Uh, I've always wanted to get a, a, a managerial uh, experience uh, because um, working for all the offices that I've worked for, uh, I've mostly done design work, not managerial stuff. So I really wanted to try and see how it would be running a team. And I did get that experience on Harvey in the end because I was running the whole department of like 25 people. But, um, but basically, yeah, I was, I was just going into it with um, um, kind of like a mixed, um, or how do I say, like a, a, a good um, synergetic um, uh, number of reasons. So it's my hometown, I wanna get the experience, um, and I really have an idea of what we should do there. Um, so it was kind of like a good blend to go into it. Um, but really, yeah, it's, um, as with all public offices, you need to, you know, you have like a competition and people apply and then they like select people. So it's not like I knew some guy who was like, hey, you know, come and join my team. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Or fortunately, actually. <laughs> Thank you. I'm wondering if all these new developments have or will have an impact across the river in, on the Russian side? If it has an impact on the other side? Um, <laughs> we really don't know what has an impact on the other side, do we? Um, it's Russia. But, um, but I think it does in a sense. Um, well, I'm sure their real estate prices are higher now because their view is better because we've reconstructed the promenade. But, um, but it does, how do I say? You know, border regions are always 
weird and they work in weird ways. Um, the proximity of Russia ne right next to Narva uh, it has an influence on Narva in a sense of like you can watch Russian TV like Russian media from Tallinn and actually believe what they're saying. In Narva, you watch Russian media, you go across the border and you're like, <laughs> BS, you know? Like, okay, tell me more, but, but you know, it's very nice how you live there in Moscow, but over here I can actually see what's going on. So people, I, I would argue uh, that maybe people in Narva buy Russian media less than people in Tallinn, uh, but that's my argument. And that's not answering your question. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that you see the other side and it does influence you. How it influences you I, or them, I don't, I don't actually know. Um, what I do know is that uh, it was almost like magic. Like when we started running for the, for the European capital of culture and made it explicit that we want to do the whole Russia meet Europe thing and we want to you know, establish ties. We're not gonna play this game of like Russia is bad because we know that Russian culture is amazing. Russian culture is worth highlighting, you know, and we can use Narva as a way to do that, or as a tool to do that. Um, once that, <laughs> we started being very vo vocal with that message, out of the blue, suddenly the whole, you know, two day, 40, or whatever, 48 hour free visa thing appeared. It was, it was almost like a sign of like, oh, that's so nice, you know, that I could actually make our concept work even better um, if we had this really easy transition across the border. And so, in a, I don't know if, if it was influenced by what we did, um, but I like to think that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks again. Yeah. Uh, there is a town legend uh, among some people who may be not so involved that uh, Estonian government started, invest, started to invest in Narva uh, after the Crimea thing. Uh, not to to prevent the break breakout or something like that. So you told the other side of the story today. Uh, how do they connect, and is it true, or how could you comment on that? That Estonian government started to invest in Narva uh, to. Like um, I can. I can comment saying that's not true, uh, because um, if we look at the time the college was built, by the time the promenade was built, by the time the um, Yoru Beach building was kind of the plans were established and the funding was granted. Like, they all happened before. So if we're talking about funding, then that is not true. But I do think that the Crimea crisis had an influence on the perception or the communication uh, between the two entities, the local government and the, and the you know, the um, uh, country government. And, and just the perception of like, oh, <laughs> shoot, you know, like, uh, that's not really good stuff for Estonia, for, for a region in Estonia to be perceived like that. Um, so I'm sure it did influence, um, but I don't think it influenced in such a way that, oh, let's like just pump cash into Narva now because, you know, otherwise it's going to blow up. Like, I, I really don't. I, I see how it makes sense. I see how it could, it's an easy way to think, but I don't think it holds true to, to the actual facts. Um, uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, the investments themselves were there. Um, but, and Narva was actually pretty good at attracting those investments as far as public money is concerned. But the communication side, yes, it was influenced, I'm sure. The beautiful thing actually is that once Narva started um, producing good stuff, or like the, you know, the festivals that uh, our team made, the European capital culture thing, then actually who won with that effort as well was Estonia, because uh, if you paid attention to the, well, it's too long to scroll, but there was a New York Times article um, about Narva, which actually said, Estonia deploys art to blah, 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 blah. It didn't, it didn't actually feature Narva in the, in the title. Uh, then there was a, an Economist article also about Estonia gets creative, blah, 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 blah. Narva was not featured in the title. So Estonia won with the work that we were doing on, you know, like we as a, as a big team um, in Narva, which is a beautiful thing. Um, and I think it gave, it gave a really strong signal to the, out, to the outside of the country as to what the actual stance is. Um, more questions? We have some, some time. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Um, good morning. I, I got a few questions, so I'll just pick one. So uh, I've never been to Narva, but I heard, like you say, like uh, most of the population speak Russian. Yep. So, so, so some of us who are foreign, so Narva is pretty much Russia, in a way. 
on to Whoa, Western no, it's not. <laughs> okay, no. Uh, you can open okay. Google Maps on your computer or whatever, and, and, and then take a look on which side of the border it is. Okay, no, I mean, like, the uh, point being is that, uh, is there a way for, for Narva to, because it is technically to us foreigners, it is the identity of the city itself. It is a border city to Russia. And uh, we can enter Russia, but we can get to Narva. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, your identity as the Russian-speaking majority population part of Estonia, is there a way to reconcile that with the, what do you call it, sentiment against Russia in some part of this country, you know, you know what I mean? Now, use the, the identity to benefit you at the same time trying to combat the sentiment against you know, Russia or Russian-speaking uh, population. Well, uh, I think I see what you're saying. Uh, I don't like the word against, um, but but basically that is what we're trying to do. That's what, like in the context of the European Capital Culture application, that's how we perceived ourselves. So we're Europe, you know, that's a geographical and political fact that we're in Europe and Estonia. Um, on the other hand, we're Russian speaking. So we're in a sense like a, 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 a chunk of Russian culture in Europe which gives us a pretty unique stance as to we can, you know, people basically, people coming to, to Narva from Russia, and we see that pretty much every day there in the city with different companies bringing their people from Russia. Uh, the, the people coming from Russia into Narva, they perceive themselves to be in Europe, but they can speak their mother tongue. On the other hand, people coming from Europe, they know that they're still in Europe, but they're almost like in Russia because everybody speaks Russian. So they kind of give the, you know, it, it, it gives you this weird, almost like, I, I don't know, like this uh, Twin Peaks sort of situation, you know, where, where it's like, I'm not really sure what's going on, but it's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So if that's what you're saying, uh, then yes, that, that, that you can actually feel that there, yeah. Well, great. I mean, the, t the ticket is actually 950 or something, I think, on the train, and you can take it from here. It's like, what, 200 meters? <laughs> if I were in tourism development, I would say yes, <laughs> do it, you know. Um, it is a simplified version of, of what I think of what is actually happening, but if it works for you, that's great. Um, but yeah, actually, as far as uh, distances, that's a good point to make. Um, Narva has been perceived as a very faraway point in Estonia for a long time. The reality is that Narva and Tartu, I think we were like, what, we're 210 kilometers, you guys are 190 or something, so it's, it's a negligible difference uh, in the distance, but it's always been perceived as like, oh my God, like I have to go to Narva, it's like four hours, you know? Uh, really it's not. <laughs> like you can, you can make it there in 215. If you take an express train from like right here, then you, you're there for a meeting, you're, you come back before dinner, you know? I mean, early dinner. So, <laughs> so it's, um, the logistical situation is actually much better um, than, than people uh, used to think. Uh, but I think during the European capital culture application thing, we, we kind of, we, we managed to fix that perception because uh, the way we announced the candidacy was we invited a bunch of different guests to Narva on 23rd of January in 2018. <laughs> and they had a special train to get to Narva. So the special train that went to Viljandi uh, a few days ago for the reception, uh, you know, the uh, independence reception, uh, we did that a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty close. Go visit. Any uh, questions? More. Mm -hmm. so more. Can you tell uh, a little bit about your current position? Do you have any projects concluded? Uh, what's, what's cooking? Um, well, I mean, in Narva, a lot of, see, the, the way, if, there are two things. Uh, in, as a chief city architect, I took over certain things from the guy who left. So it's not like I come back and then I start from, you know, ground zero and then I build whatever I want. Like, there is a, a huge chunk of work that's been done by the guy before me. So I take that, put it on my desk, and then I see what else I need to do. So it's, it's kind of like this flow you know, and I only enter that flow in a certain time period and then somebody else is before me and after me. So right now the person who is there, um, not as a chief city architect, but as the director of the department, she is managing a lot of the projects that were started during my tenancy there. So, so the work continues without me uh, and we consult constantly. But as far as my current job uh, at the ministry, 
Um, I do, it's, it's a much more, hmm, how do I say? Okay, so I've only been there for a month. So, yeah. But, uh, but, but basically what is going on is that um, there is a, gosh, that's, it's a big topic. Um, like, you know about the European Green Deal, you know about all the different regulations and directives that the European Union has accepted and made more or less mandatory for member states to adopt like the European uh, or the energy certificates of buildings and you know the CO2 emission calculations and things like this. So all of that work that has to do with the built environment and the way it influences the environment, like the general environment, is what I'm gonna, or not going to, but what I do. Um, so on the one hand, it's a very, it's a lot of paperwork because I have to um, kind of bring the European law or European, you know, regulations over to the Estonian uh, space, ju judicial space. On the other hand, communicate what is important for Estonia in this particular um, area to, you know, to the outside, and then manage the local change as far as the built environment is concerned, and energy efficiency, uh, sustainable use of materials, um, sustainability as such. Um, and um, I don't know, as, a, as an architect, um, I'm pretty excited because I think sustainability is a topic that can be perceived very technically. So you can only start calculating kilowatts per hour per square meter per year, you know, and then be like, yeah, you know, we scored the A-class building, awesome. But it's, you know, it, if, if you build that in the middle of the field, uh, then it's, it's, it's not a win. So there is a there is a level of hol kind of holistic. It needs to be very holistic. The way we approach the environment and sustainability needs to be more holistic than the, it, I perceive it being currently, um, and that's my personal mission. That's something that I think sh needs to be established somehow. Uh, I'm not sure how, but I'm working on it. Does that answer your question? You had a more specific. No, the environment. Yeah, the built environment and the environment. Yeah. Love forever. <laughs> yeah. So considering Narva's history as being a very industrial town, mm. are there other vacant industrial structures that uh, are being used now aside from the one uh, that's used for the festivals and what sort of projects are happening? Oof. <laughs> uh, the one, yes we do, is the answer. Um, uh, the, the facility that I showed you, the Krenholm factory, well, that facility has a quarter of a million square meters of real estate. That's a lot. That's a lot, a lot. That's like, I think Teleskivi altogether is what, like 50,000? So that thing is like five times larger, or six. Um, so um, there are a lot of unoccupied spaces, um, and there is a lot of work that could be done. Uh, but see, we only, in a, in a sense, uh, and that's something that you live with as an architect, is that the processes that you do take a very long time. So. Uh, we only started with this kind of change, or Narva started changing rapidly in the last two, three years. And that is not a very good statistical sample to make any conclusions just yet. We'll see in 10 years where it reaches. But I know that, the, well, I mean, in that Krenholm facility or near to it, part of that complex, um, is the Narva art residency uh, that Marina used to work with. with um, you know, so you, you have artists from all around the world coming to Narva and doing pieces on, like, art pieces that have to do with social issues, uh, you know, and multiculturalism. Uh, then uh, there are a few co-working spaces that are starting to emerge in that area. Then we have the Baltiets factory, and I, I showed that um, at some point. Uh, basically, you know Jana Pavlenkova, anyone? Raise your hand who knows Jana Pavlenkova here. Okay, so, um, yep, there you go. Um, so she's, She's running an, a startup incubator in Narva, which is called Objekt. Uh, so check it out. Uh, if uh, I think it's spelled with a K, Objekt. Um, but anyways, um, so check that out. Yeah, and it 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 it, it it's run like in basically in this uh, complex. This one is right in the center of the city. So there is a theater on one. It used to be a manufact. Not the, it used to be a top secret facility for for research on on nuclear um, uh, for the nuclear industry in the Soviet Union. Basically, big deal. Um, and <laughs> but now it's been refurbished. Like partially, it still has industry in there. Uh, but on the other hand, the 
some of the facilities have been refurbished into a theater and a startup incubator, into uh, like the Estonian Language Center, uh, the integrations um, fund uh, has their headquarters there and stuff. So there are things that are happening, but see, we have so much of that leftover space that uh, it wouldn't be realistic to think that we can fill it uh, with, within a couple of years. And that is one of the reasons why festivals and theater performances like Kreml Ebikut done by the Tartarus Theater was a beautiful example. Ran for two years, uh, I mean two weeks every year uh, for the last two years. Um, and it filled the space. So it brought the people and it filled the space, gave it purpose and meaning without necessarily having to invest into like bricks and mortar. Well, and the festival, the Station Arbor Festival that we did in Kreinholm the first year, did exactly the same thing. Like, it's just about kind of showing like, hey guys, there is like this really cool space. Uh, you should come check it out and maybe then you can, you know, start doing something with it. So yeah, there's plenty of work and go take a look at it. <laughs> more? We have, I think, time for some questions more. Any, any more? Okay, then uh, I have a question about, to continue about the story, but uh, Russian border. Uh, mm -hmm. Were any were there or any like plans or projects you try to cooperate with the with the Russia? I know some story about this. Uh, yes. Uh, promenade that it was kind of. Oh, you mean like generally? Okay. Yes. yes. Um, there are a bunch of projects that are done together with the Russian partners. So the promenade, indeed, um, is. Mm, how do I explain it? Like basically there is a, you know, European funds are divided into like these different kind of sections of like there is a whatever cohesion funds, there are these funds, those funds, different kinds of funds. And then within those funds, there is even smaller chunks of like this goes to here, this goes to there. And so one of those sub chunks is for Russia, Europe, uh, com like communal projects or com common projects between Russia and Europe. And Narva obviously has benefited from a bunch of those uh, like opportunities. Like the promenade is one of them, then the upper promenade. So the so-called dark garden is the other one. Currently the promenade is being extended another 800 meters uh, with another project that is also done with the Russian side uh, as a partner. There is a port uh, or like more a marina, not a port, but a marina um, being built um, upstream on the Narva River, which is built basically using the funds that are split between Narva and a city, and a different city on the Russian side, not Ivan Gorod that we immediately border with, but the other one, Slance. So there, there are those specific funds that the European Union allocates to work, you know, across the border. Uh, on the other hand, of course, there is a lot of like a cultural, um, how do I say, uh, merge, uh, you know, or cross-cultural or cross-border cultural initiatives. Yes, that is the right, <laughs> that is the right way to say it. Uh, cross-border cultural initiatives, um, including different festivals again, you know, concerts, theater performances, like Baba Lava actually is a great example of, of, um, of a center that uh, has its concept explicitly built on providing a platform for Russian directors to perform in Europe and then for European performers to kind of project out to Russia. So it's it's a really it's a really cool communication platform in a sense. Uh, plus, I mean, the whole European Capital Culture Initiative. We had a, we had like in the book, in the bid book that we had to submit, which had to con, you know, which had to have um, an actual cultural program chapter in it. Uh, within that, we had three different like strands of the program. Um, I didn't start showing them today, just not to bore you guys, but basically the first one was, uh, you know, international, like Narva is the hub between East and West. It was called the end of East and West. Um, so the end of like the dichotomy. Then the second one was um, uh, from Salzburg, what was it? Gosh, I'm forgetting things. Ah, untold stories and then uh, building the future, essentially. Those are the three. Um, so the first chapter, whole first chapter, was dedicated to co-working or like co-production with um, with the Russian um, uh, partners, and the Russian partners also featured in the other strands of the program too. So there was a lot of it was a heavy load, um, or like how do I say it was a lot of um, a lot of projects that had to do between uh, with uh, communication between Russian and European partners. And European, I don't mean only Estonian and only Narva. I mean like you know, European, like all, all, all over. Okay, and, and 
something worked out already or it's still like... How do the program of the European Capital Culture? Um, it's, it's in the works slowly, um, but there are a few things that are already working. Uh, I mean, Station Narva, for example, right? The festival that I help organize as well. Um, like a third of the people who perform there are from Russia. So. Next, next year we have Station Narva. I mean, yeah. This, this year. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, program yeah. is not unknown. So no, it's still a little too early. Uh, any, any surprises? <laughs> well, we shall see. Okay. You don't have to wait till September, though. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, when you're... Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Vanya. So, <laughs> so when you were leaving uh, the position of chief architect in Narva, were people telling you that, please, uh, Ivan, don't leave? We, we won't survive with you. Or something that's, like uh, that's, a that's a personal question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is a personal question. Um, okay. There were both. I mean, I'm sure there are some people who were happy that I'm leaving because I was making their life difficult. Because as a city architect, you tend to be that guy who's like, you are not going to do that, you know? Or, or, yeah, so some people don't like that. If you're used to people saying, oh, yeah, of course, go ahead, you know? Um, but on the other hand, some other people, I'm sure, did not really like the idea of me leaving. Uh, but the way that I'm trying to see it is that, see, I'm here in front of you. I work for the Ministry of Communications and uh, Economic Affairs and Communications, but I can still talk about my birth town uh, or my, my hometown. So it's the one doesn't really cancel the other out. I don't think that, you know, every one of us who goes into a different environment becomes a sort of an ambassador of the place that we came from. Uh, so in a sense, I think maybe I'm doing more good for Narva by not being there currently, but rather working at the ministry and actually raising the topics of the regional development and, you know, like, hey guys, what works for you in Tallinn doesn't necessarily work in Nidaviru County and, you know, and stuff like this. So I think that is a very important position to, to, to be in. Um, and so in a sense, uh, that is something that is important that keeps me from being like, oh my God, why did I go? You know, like, I'm a traitor. Like, no, I'm not. I continue the work, but on a different level. Thanks. All right. So it's like mo moving from local to regional, then global scale, right? It's kind of your movement from local. What is actually <laughs> local means? Is it uh, is Google it. Glocal <laughs> <laughs> is just a nasty sounding word. Nasty sounding word. <laughs> <laughs> so we have any, maybe more of these came to you with questions? No? No? Okay, yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about the solar panels like in Estonia? Is it, is it, I saw something on the top of the buildings, but uh, yeah. is it really sunny here? Is it what? It isn't really sunny here. I mean, does it make sense? Well, I mean, the technology has advanced so far from what we, you know, still remember it being that actually the solar panels, <laughs> it's like, you know, the, the advisor for sustainable construction at the Ministry of Economics and Communications says, you don't need sun for solar panels. Uh, but <laughs> but um, you don't actually need direct sun for them. So the solar panels can completely work in the weather like today. Of course, they are not like at their top efficiency, but, but they still can work produce electricity, um, it, you know, this weather that we have doesn't actually cancel them out. And I feel really good about us having more solar panels. I think it's great, actually, because uh, <laughs> we have to take our power from somewhere. Um, and solar panels seem to be like a great option, actually. Thank you. And one more question about no. the promenade. I heard that uh, promenade in Narva is like uh, twice larger than promenade in Ivangorod. Is that true? No, it's not true. <laughs> it's eight times longer. <laughs> but uh, actually, yeah, that's a, that's a really good joke. Um, <laughs> but it is eight times longer at the moment. Um, and I, I don't know enough about why it happened that way. Uh, but the fact is, yeah, when you're on the Estonian side, you have a promenade that stretches for like 800 something meters. And then on the Russian side, it's 100 plus. Um, 
I think they were funded through different initiatives. I think the, the reality was that the, the promenades are there, yeah, but this promenade, the, the one on the Russian side, was not actually part of the same program as the one on the Estonian side. It was, the program, it was um, done concurrently with the upper promenade, which is a much um, cheaper, uh, how do I say, a much simpler version. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, it's not that obvious, but it is a good, it is, yeah, it's something I hear a lot. It's like, hey, is that, is that, is, what is that? <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. About this promenade, I just can add because I tried to dig into the subject as I watched the video from Varlamov, the urbanist, mm -hmm. uh, Russian urbanist, and he tried, he's captured like, hey, here's so beautiful and here's so ugly and like making jokes no. of this Russian, uh, government things and then I started digging into the subject and actually it was this about the investment that it was not actually this long but this, this, this short one. But, but I don't know, see, yeah. but the issue is how much money did it cost? I don't know. Mm. Like I don't remember. But I think it was a pretty expensive promenade for the length of it. Like that. I heard that on, for Russia they even gave more but the result was Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say is yeah. that there was something related to that as well. And they used more expensive materials, very fancy lighting and everything, uh, and so it kind of, like the budget stopped and, and you can't continue with fancy stuff anymore. Well, they're now actually, now we're extending our, prom our promenade another like kilometer or so mm -hmm. along the river, and they're building another chunk, which is going to be maybe 400 meters um, to the promenade that they already have. So the, the work is continuing. And uh, more questions? No. I have one, maybe la I think last question then. Uh, as I work, yes, I worked in Narva Art Residency and we had lots of artists there coming. And actually artists are not just like coming to draw, but they were making researches about the mm -hmm. city. They were like very, l like staying there for months or weeks and trying to get the city, understand what's happening and try to work it through the art. But uh, I, my question is, how actually, I'm just interested how for the government, these researchers of artists or any kind of other, I don't know, people who come to make research about the city, are they work out? Do they have some kind of implementations after? Do you mean the local government? Uh, yeah, or yeah, local in this sense. Do they take into account something, take some good points from it, or it's not that much? Um. It's, it's just generally Not for researches also for the city. As I, for example, did research about festivals as well, but I never know, like, does it actually then go somewhere? I mean, You know, I think, okay, um, I see your point. And I would, I, I would say that in most cases, probably not. Maybe in some rare occasions, um, the research that we do is valuable, or like in case of Narva, is valuable for the government. But the point is that the government is not, how do I say, like you don't, you don't have to wait for the government to do stuff. Like, the gov you know, that's something that the whole presentation was partially about. Like, you don't, you don't start directing the built environment as a city architect using your authority, you know. Like, you, 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 you kind of nurture others to do it. And then the government reacts, or they see that they just can't keep ignoring certain things, or they really need to look into this because it's kind of getting a momentum and stuff. So it's, uh, it's not like, you know... Uh, you really, we really should not wait for the government to appreciate or accept whatever we do. Um, you just need to make sure that you're doing a good thing and then that, other, that the actual clients appreciate it, whoever they are, like you are the, you know, you're, uh, the people who, I don't know, buy your product or, or attend your festivals or do, you know, participate in your workshops. Um, and the government, I mean, they have other things to do. Um, so it's... Uh, it's nice when it's linked, but it doesn't have to be. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot. I think we need to wrap up as everyone. It's Friday, it's still working day. <laughs> need to go to work, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Ivan, for the story. Thank you. And I really, guys, recommend you to come to Narva. It's a super interesting city. I fell in love with it. Like, I actually, it's, I'm from Tallinn myself, but I never... I never see, see Narva as a destination because it was always like I go to St. Petersburg, I can have a coffee like maybe through. break through. Yeah. yeah. It was always like just just a stop, but never a destination. And when I came started we were starting we started to work with artists there and try to make research and all these like amazing local people actually there are so many stories from Krenholm from this uh, Venice, I, I was so inspired with this Venice, uh, Narva Venice, I'm still looking <laughs> also, for, like, we need to make research. Will it stay there? I mean, they are, they the are Venice? in Venice? Yes. No, they're gonna be there, yeah. Okay.
this is yeah, this is another story. So there are many many stories. So uh, and uh, I think Station Arva is a good uh, actually event to come and get to know more about city. Yeah, but Station Arva, I mean, it's in September. Um, so yeah, yeah. it's um, it's a little bit like Tallinn Music Week, where you, it's not that hot or green yet, you know. Uh, Maybe but you can cycle in cities. Or walk in yeah, what I'm trying to say is that you don't have to wait that long. Yeah, um, Narva is. Like Narva is where the castle is, where you know Cranholm, the Venice, and all of that. So it's like a city, a, well, not a town, uh, but um, <laughs> in the scale of some countries, it's like not even there. But okay, uh, and then 15 kilometers from it, you can take a taxi there or a free bus. Um, there is Narva Yeso, which is a teeny tiny resort, but it's beautiful. It's like gorgeous. It's right on the it's right on the sea. There are a lot of pine trees, and it's like just a beautiful little place. So. So if some of you guys are considering going to that region, then I suggest that you like maybe take a car and you know take your time with getting there because on the way there are a lot of these old manors and mansions and things. And then once you're there, spend a couple of days, stay in Narva Yesu in a hotel, go to spa, but then you know spay, kind of like stay the day in Narva, and that would be like a really good package uh, if you want to kind of you know um, get to know it the region. Visit, visit Narva campaign. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, oh. I mean, it's, it's really nice to come there. I mean, it's always nice to discover. I, okay, one more. We, I mean, I'm fine. You have time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If other is fancy waiting or. Uh, the station Narva thing. How how long does it last? It's only a couple of days. We usually okay, do so it. Oh. It implies staying in Narva. Yeah, of course. Are there enough hotels? No. <laughs> that's part of the that's part of the, that's part of the reason why we're doing it uh, to 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 again right the effort is to show and highlight the need for development in a certain place it's not done because we well I mean obviously it is done because we like music but for me as a city architect and as a person who's interested in city development it's an effort to be like hey guys start building hotels actually in the picture of Abalava the huge red brick building next to it they're planning to build that into a hotel or like restructure. Uh, I can share my uh, experience first visiting Vilja and the Folk. Uh -huh. I happened to visit this um, concert venue and I asked the, the lady that was, uh, well, it, it wasn't Folk week yet. It was maybe two weeks before. And I asked the lady who was selling tickets and CDs and stuff, um, do you know any local, because I knew that there are no hotels available for those days uh -huh. anymore in Vilind, in Norway. And I asked, do you know any local people who offer uh -huh. like, uh, rooms? Yeah. <laughs> and she said, oh, let, me, let, me, let me check my Facebook. Just a few, I have been, I've been reading that um, city major told to the local community, register your flats or rooms or somewhere that you're uh, able to rent out. Maybe something like that should be done in Narva? To tell uh, the local I mean, community. people do. No, there, I mean, obviously, the people do manage their accommodations. It's not like you come in and then you stay on a bench in a park. Uh, you know, like you can do that too, of course. Uh, but, uh, but no, there are Airbnb apartments. You can stay in Narva, which has a pretty big capacity for, for a tiny town that it is. It's like one and a half thousand beds. So it's, um, you know, uh, we manage Kremlie Ebikut which brought, what, like overall about 50,000 people to the city. But did they so, stay for overnight after? No, the, the, some of them did, some of them didn't. But what I'm trying to say is that there is capacity if you, and you can find accommodation if you're looking for it. It's not like it's complete, you know, it's a field and you have to pitch up a tent. Uh, like, yeah, there, there, there is accommodation available. It's just not like you can come in and, you know, and choose between a Hilton and like a park no, inn. <laughs> yeah, we're not there yet. Yeah. Well, maybe give a free workshop to those babushkas who run, who have a f uh, free uh, room when the kids or grandkids left. We, we might get into that more uh, for this year. We didn't do that explicitly previously. I think it always happens with the city. Like, for example, in Katowice, Poland, they also started to make festival off, which was always kind of underground festival, and they tried not to promote it because they wanted it to be pretty much Niche, local, but yeah. they failed because now already you can't book anything in, in Katowice because everyone well. somehow knew about this festival after like well. five years or something, and they it's want to all to be in this underground yeah, yeah. festival. It's like it's the thing with exclusive things, right? Like they always yeah. produce crowds. 
But anyway, yes. thank you guys. Um, thank you. We'll need to go to work. <laughs> Or I don't know. It's, you All right, I'm excited. Okay, <laughs> okay, thank you guys. All right, for thank you very much. And if uh, ours is, if you have something to show, you can bring it here if you want. We usually take a look on on your drawings. If you if you don't like, you can just tag us and we will share online. <laughs>